Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Sports Exchange here on the South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network. My name is Scott Morganroth, and I'm with Louis Adio Weiss, and leading off here and is Ryan Skorud. And Ryan, I'll tell you what, man, interesting fantasy weekend, isn't it, here on the South Sports Exchange, the South Florida Tribune Broadcasting Network. How was your weekend? Uh, my weekend ran the gamut from being really good, having some great matchups, to having the worst score I've ever had in fantasy. So, but oh. that's what happens. That's what happens when you have um, when you have Jared Goff and Keenan Allen and Austin Eckler. Um, you have Will Disley go down with an injury before he ever gets a before he even gets a target. Um, and let's see who else did I have? Yeah, so it was it was one of those weeks for me. All right, well, let's get, I'll take care of business. we only got 15 minutes tonight because we're going to have a, so it's a busy show. We're going to lead off with you, and I'll get to the guests in a moment. But, all right, Ryan, we talked about the Aaron Jones-Jamal Williams dilemma. Why is it a dilemma, Ryan? Well, here's the deal. We are, we've, we've discussed this in the preseason, even in the first couple weeks. Matt LaFleur was the head coach or was the, the offensive coordinator in Tennessee last year. And last year... For some reason, the the Tennessee Titans continue to split carries between Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis, and for no one could figure out why. Um, you know, you figured it would be Deion Lewis would be the guy more in, in that t- uh, Tariq Cohen role, catching passes out of the backfield, maybe even getting used in the slot as a receiver, and then you'd have you know Derrick Henry be like your hammer. Uh, running between the tackles. That makes complete sense. But that's not what they did. Instead, they basically passed everything out evenly from receptions and targets to actual carries. And neither guy was really all that productive at all the entire season until you get to, um, you know, what was it, week 13 or 14 when um, when Derrick Henry runs over the Jacksonville defense for, you know, 200 and some odd yards and four touchdowns. This is the dilemma that we are now facing in Green Bay with Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams. Last night, they basically split carries down the middle. At one point, um, Jones basically gets benched because he uh, of losing a fumble and then dropping a pass that was a surefire, you know, touchdown. And because of that, you know, more, you know, more work went to Jamal Williams, and Jamal Williams did a lot more with his work with his uh, touches. Getting a passing touch, you're getting a receiving touchdown, uh, having a 45 yard run. Uh, I want to say he finished with uh, over 100 overall yards, and he showed that he was going to be the more productive. That being said, they didn't just go with the hot hand in Jamal Williams. They basically split it even and kept putting in Aaron Jones, and then pulled Aaron Jones, and then kept giving the ball to Jamal Williams. So here's the deal. Aaron Jones right now at half point PPR is the number five running back. A lot of that has to do with last week's game, and you know, I want to say a couple weeks before where he had another you know pretty decent game. Jamal Williams right now is only owned in like sixteen percent of fantasy leagues, and he is definitely a guy that you want to have because he provides that flex appeal or bi week you know bi week wider or bi week running back to um, ability. Um, moving forward for the rest of the season, because again, we don't know who is going to be who is going to be the lead back. It's somewhat of a guessing game, but with Aaron Jones' injury history, obviously Jamal Williams is going to be the next guy up. So I think that for me, I see more value in Jamal Williams than I do in Aaron Jones. Okay, very good. All right, so let's talk about the Rams. We have another uh, seven eight minutes left to go. Uh, what happened to the Rams' offense? All I know is a kicker, uh, Zerline, got me only one point. That isn't very much. Well, here's the, here's the deal with what's going on with the Rams. Um, their offense has just been uh, has just been really out of sync lately. Uh, they should be in for a very good game this next week against the Falcons. The Falcons, basically, their entire defense is just a sieve waiting for the water to be poured through it. Um their offense, well, the, the passing for the Rams in terms of yardage is sixth in the league. Um, their, their rushing is still only 20 seconds. They haven't really been able to establish the running game. And because of that, it's caused some struggles, especially this last week, um, in terms of the passing game. Uh, 
the play calling is what's really confusing me and really has been, I think, the biggest effect um, and, or has caused the biggest effect on the Rams' offense. We look at what they did in this first in this uh, first series against the, the San Francisco 49ers. They ran, I want to say, they ran eight plays, including getting all the way down to the one-yard line, and then two run plays, not able to stuff it in. Um, Daryl Henderson looked like he was the more... Um, agile and more um, useful back, more explosive, and yet they kept giving the ball to Malcolm Brown. And then when they finally tried to pass it, at that point they had no choice but to pass it because they were getting behind, not being able to establish the run. And this is the same. This is the same Rams offense that just two and three weeks ago, were, I think, had two or three runs in the first quarter let alone running nine times on the first, you know, seven times on the first drive. So the, the play calling has become very inconsistent. I know they're trying to game plan for who they're going up against. This week I think will be much better, again, going into into Atlanta against the Falcons team whose defense is um, uh, 26th in the league just in terms of yardage. Um, and so this, is, this will be a good bounce-back game for uh, Jared Goff, for Cooper Cup, um, and even for even for Robert Woods, the so Robert Woods had a decent game. Um, it's going to be hard right now. If they're really wanting to establish the run, um, it's going to be hard for them to do that without Todd Gurley. Um, I think that uh, Daryl Henderson, I believe, is the more um, explosive. Like I said from this last week, is more explosive the two running backs they have right now. If Gurley is out, but they just don't really seem to want to trust the rookie. So. Okay, let's go up to the Pacific Northwest. You mentioned it. Now you get to talk about it. Is there a Seattle replacement for Will Disley? Yes, and he's actually owned in one percent of leagues. He uh, he's played for two other teams in the last year, and that is Mr. Luke Wilson. Now I know he's not going to be a he's not going to be a top five tight end. That's not what they asked Luke Wilson to be. However, Luke Wilson has had a fair amount of success in the Seahawks offense, though he's only been back with the Seahawks for, was it, a, a couple weeks. Um, he's already had, I want to say, four or five catches. Has not gotten into the end zone yet, but again, he is, because he blocks so well and has the ability to catch the ball, not quite as dynamic as Will Disley, um, not quite as athletic as Will Disley, but because he does have that ability to catch the ball pretty well, um, he will be, I think that going on for the rest of the season, he could be a top 10 tight end by the end of the season. It'll take a little bit, um, and it'll take some decent games, but he may end up being more of a streamer, but I think that with what this offense is doing, it will provide him the opportunity to possibly become a, a top 10 tight end with how just a crazy and, and top heavy the tight end position is. I also believe that this will provide more opportunity for DK Metcalf in the red zone, um, you know, using him as the big body instead of just having a little Disley. Okay, but one more question on my end, and that's this. Why is Matt Patricia, Matt Prater, although Matt Patricia, we have another MP in Detroit, but why is Matt Prater only owned in 23% of the Yahoo leagues since this guy kicks long field goals quite a bit, and he, and he had five of them yesterday? Well, here's, here's the deal. A lot of the times with kickers, there are a lot of leagues that are just getting rid of kickers um, in general because of the unpredictability um, of the kicking position um, and field goals in the offense. Um, that being said, a lot, of the, a lot of times the highly owned kickers, it's more predicated on how high-powered the offense is. Right. So a higher-powered offense is usually going to have their kicker more involved um, with extra, you know, at least getting you know two or three points out of extra points, and maybe a field goal or two, which usually is where your your six to eight point um, uh, projection is going to line them up with kickers. So that's why there's not. I mean, while the 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 Lions defense is pre or Lions offense has played okay, it hasn't been explosive, and that's why Prater has been a little less owned uh, in leagues this year. Yeah, all I basically did was I, I'm hoping to pick him up for probably a couple of weeks uh, when Zerline goes on his bye 
and now that this league's out, I can afford the roster spot for him. And then I'll go back to the old uh, pick up the other playmaker. Lewis, you want to add anything real quickly while we have about two minutes to go in the segment, three minutes? As far as fantasy goes, I mean, you know, if you've got Jimmy Garoppolo on your team, keep going with it because, you know, with that offensive line right now and just how good that defense is, I mean, the guy's going to put up some mega fantasy points, and I don't even think he's really broken out yet. You know, I think you give him a couple more weeks to get into the flow of things, he's going to have he's going to have a big second half in those final eight weeks, and, you know, that's already a scary team right now as far as the Super Bowl is concerned, but, you know, Luke Wilson's been a member of that Seahawks team for a while, and he's never really played a massive role in that team. He's always kind of been like that second tight end on that depth chart, but given the, you know, injury they have, you know, he may have to step up in a big way, although Wilson, you know, he seems to have been doing just fine without Wilson's contributions thus far. Yeah, well, he, again, over the last... Uh or through the through the uh, the second half, or after was it after Gisley went down in the first half? Again, Wilson still had a couple of, still had a couple of catches. Um, he had a couple the week before, so I, I think that he can again. I think that he can be useful. He may be more of a streamer, but I think that he will have enough enough games that by the end of the season he may come close to cracking that top ten. I, I'm not seeing the consistency won't necessarily be there. I'm one of it's more of. He could have enough of the big games that because, again, of how top-heavy the, the tight end position is, those lower guys, none of them are really consistent. You know, from from tight end 7 to about tight end 13, none of them are consistent. They're just, you know, they've had enough good games to offset the bad games. Now, one of these things that we'll do here is to wrap up the segment, and when, this will give our fans an opportunity to prepare for it. Is I know we know there's there's breaking news that the Jags traded cornerback Jalen Ramsey to the Rams for uh, first round picks in 2021, along with a fourth round pick. So one of the things I want you to do tonight, Ryan, is why don't you uh, examine the fantasy impact about where the Jaguars defense goes from here, and also the uh, Rams defense because I think they're definitely two organizations that have definitely gone ahead and been impacted by the trade. And I will say this before we close your segment out. Tom Coughlin wanted two first-round picks. He held out for it, and the Rams uh, definitely took it. I think those two teams made a major trade defensively before uh, last year, I believe. So uh, it's not uh, Dante un- Fowler Jr. Right, there you go. Thank you. So Dante Fowler Jr., so it's not uncommon for these two uh, teams to go ahead and uh, – make these big trades and now I think the Jacksonville Jaguars got a pretty good return on their uh, uh, investment so why don't you go ahead and uh, examine anything you want to say before we talk about it in more detail tomorrow uh, as far as, as far as that Rams trade the, the Rams and the, and the Jaguars what we can talk about you know in our in our podcast tomorrow yeah. I think the main thing that I would want to talk discuss is how it's going to affect the teams that play them that's where the biggest effect is going to be seen now that the Jacksonville Jaguars don't have Jalen Ramsey, how is that going to affect the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the New Orleans Saints, the teams in that division playing against them? And the same thing for the Rams dealing with the 49ers, the uh, the um, the Arizona Cardinals, and the uh, and one more game against the uh, against the Seahawks. So that's where those that's where those kind of trades for the defense are going to have the biggest uh, effect. Yeah, I think it's ironic too how you say that too, Ryan, because. Uh... The Jaguars have played without Ramsey the last couple of weeks anyway, so it's kind of like we're transitioning into where you're going with this thought. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, one I, I, I should mention is I ended up beating my brother-in-law by a point, and Stafford ha- didn't have one of his better games, but I had just enough. One sack away would have sacked me at a time when uh, uh, I lost some key guys, but I'll take these ugly wins all that, all that we can have them in. Yesterday was ugly. Gives me bragging rights, at least for a few weeks against my brother-in-law. But anyways, all right, so let's stack the getting deck tomorrow. Anything you want to add before we close out? Uh, no, I mean, I think we touched on everything we needed to. Just, you know, weird game for Christian McCaffrey this week. And although he did have two touchdowns, one on the ground, one in the air, even though he had like 22 carries for 31 yards. But, you know, still good fantasy week if you can get him in there and, you know, get him in the, in the end zone. So I think that's all that matters as far as fantasy is concerned. All right, Ryan. Yeah, we'll, he, he still ended up being the number one uh, running back in fantasy this past week. So, or yeah. number two, I believe, behind James Conner. A compromise, Jay, um, Christian McCaffrey, still the best in fantasy. I love it. MVP thus far. Except if you're playing him. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean. Just as far as total value, he's been fantastic.